Rudy Giuliani's attorney is suing Rudy for $1.4 million in unpaid legal fees, which means Rudy must go to court and has to hire more lawyers he won't be able to pay. Rudy is reportedly getting sued by Robert Costello, a lawyer and longtime friend of Rudy's. They go all the way back to the 1970s. They're great friends. So how do you put a price on a friendship? $1.4 million. According to the lawsuit, Costello began representing Giuliani in 2019, and it ended this summer after Rudy refused to pay him. Refused? He has no money. That's why he turned to his friend. Costello assisted Rudy in defending Rudy in two disbarment proceedings in New York City and Washington, D.C., which Rudy seems to have lost. He's also defended Rudy uh, in some criminal investigations that are going on with Jack Smith and, of course, the racketeering trial in Georgia where he was indicted. Seems to me, considering the legal predicament Rudy finds himself in, I, I don't know. It seems to me that Mr. Costello, Rudy's lawyer, it seems to me Mr. Costello is the one who owes Rudy $1.4 million. I mean, I buy a coffee maker and it doesn't work. I take it back. I get a refund. But Rudy's lawyer gets him indicted, gets his law license suspended in D.C. and New York, doesn't protect him from being indicted, doesn't protect Rudy from losing his law license in Washington, D.C. and New York. And somehow Rudy owes $1.4 million. The coffee maker didn't work. According to Costello, Rudy currently has 10 civil lawsuits filed against him. Well, I'm sorry, that would now be 11 <laughs> civil lawsuits filed against Rudy. His own attorneys are suing Rudy. He has no money. Rudy, you're going to be 80. Just go to prison. There's a bed, three square meals, and no lawyers. Well, no lawyers who can sue you anymore. This is the mop-up for September 19th, 2023. I'm David Feldman, and I make uh, mistakes occasionally, and I made a mistake on Friday's show when I played a clip of President Biden telling an audience in Maryland that he taught political theory at the University of Pennsylvania for four years. I played this clip. Democracy is at stake, folks. Our democracy is under attack. And we got to fight for it. I taught at the University of Pennsylvania for four years, and I used to teach political theory. And folks, you're always here. Every generation has to fight for democracy. And I found myself, it's automatic. We didn't have to believe it. But we do. We do. Okay, I call that a lie, and I kind of stand corrected. Okay, President Biden never taught political theory at the University of Pennsylvania for four years. He did hold an honorary professor position at the University of Pennsylvania between 2017 and 2021. That would be four years, okay? But he did not teach any official courses. He gave talks and lectures as an honorary professor. So I misspoke kind of, sort of, and he kind of, sort of misspoke. I, I did make a mistake when I said that Biden has never taught before, and that was not true. For 17 years, Joe Biden served as adjunct professor at Delaware Law School. But here, here is the problem. The University of Pennsylvania is Ivy League. And for some reason, President Biden likes to keep repeating this lie when he talks to college kids. I mean, it's not the first time. This was him last year talking to college kids. In a lot of university campuses. Matter of fact, for four years, I was a full professor at the University of Pennsylvania. It's not true. Uh, I think he believes it. Uh, I misspoke. He misspoke. I'm voting for him. Let's call it even. The government's fiscal year ends on September 30th. And without a new budget, 
everything shuts down. Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy is trying to pass a resolution that would provide 30 days of funding to keep our government from shutting down. And he introduced a measure on Sunday that, if passed, would impose an 8% cut on all federal spending except for the military. It also doesn't include any additional funding for Ukraine. Republicans have a five-vote majority in the House, which gives the far-right Freedom Caucus a lot of power. McCarthy's already getting pushback from the Freedom Caucus. Members like Florida Representative Matt Gates, who says these proposed cuts don't go deep enough, and more than five Republican lawmakers in the House have complained that the new budget resolution introduced on Sunday doesn't include defunding Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's investigation into Donald Trump. If this bill can't move through the House, the government will shut down on October 1st. Freedom Caucus member Chip Roy said a government shutdown is inevitable. This is not what McCarthy wants. Here is the Republican speaker earlier on Monday. It's a good thing I love a challenge, because every day is going to be a challenge. We've got a long week. We're not, we're not September 30th yet, but the one thing I'll tell everybody, um, I've never seen anybody win a shutdown. You only put the power in the hands of the administration. If you want to secure the border, pass Homeland. If you want to make uh, America strong and secure, you pass the DOD probes bill. If you're not willing to pass appropriation bills and you're not willing to pass a continuing resolution to allow you to pass the rest of appropriation bills and you don't want an omnibus, I don't quite know what you want. So, I mean, we just have to get together, figure it out, and move forward. I really don't know what the Freedom Caucus wants. Well, they don't want you and they want to shut down the government. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has succeeded in painting the Republicans in the corner when it comes to a government shutdown. He has made some sort of deal with Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican. McConnell has agreed to a 30-day spending bill to keep the government open. So all the blame for a government shutdown will go towards the Republicans in the House. And like I said, they are in significant danger. The Republicans are in significant danger of losing the House in 2024. I talked about this last week. At least 12 new congressional districts are being redrawn by the courts as we speak, with most of those new districts favoring Democrats. All they need are five to flip the House. McCarthy is getting it from both ends. The Freedom Caucus says his proposal doesn't cut enough, and here is Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer early Monday morning complaining that McCarthy's short-term bill cuts too much. Last night, House GOP members released what they called a deal for a CR, but in reality reads like a hard right screed. Instead of working with Democrats to keep government open, House Republicans want to cut virtually all non-defense spending by a devastating 8%. 8%. 8% cuts to law enforcement, cancer research, and other critical priorities. Not one penny is dedicated to the president's disaster relief request, despite the anguish in so many states. No health extenders are included. No attempt to reauthorize the FAA. And with no Ukraine funding, the proposal is an insult to Ukraine and a gift to Putin. I cannot think of a worse welcome for President Zelensky, who visits us this week, than this House proposal, which ignores Ukraine entirely. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky is in New York right now. He's in New York City to address the U.N. General Assembly later this week. He paid a visit to a New York City hospital that's treating Ukrainian soldiers who were injured in the war. During an interview... On 60 Minutes Sunday night, Zelensky warned that if Ukraine fails to stop Putin, Putin will push further west towards Poland and the Baltic states. Zelensky is scheduled to visit the White House on Thursday to meet with President Biden, who has promised to keep providing military and humanitarian support for, quote, however long it takes. Republicans, since the beginning of the Russian invasion, have been somewhat reluctant 
to stand up to Putin. There is a split among the presidential candidates running for the Republican nomination. Some say Putin's invasion was wrong, but America can't give a blank check to Zelensky. Vivek Ramaswamy has proposed letting Putin keep Ukraine's Donbass region. It's in the east. That's something, it's a region that Putin has already claimed for Russia. That's where a lot of the fighting is going on right now. Here is former Vice President Mike Pence speaking at the Hudson Institute, staking his claim in support of Ukraine and accusing some within his own party, the people he's running against, accusing some of them of being isolationists. Some Republican candidates, including my former running mate, are abandoning the traditional conservative position of American leadership on the world stage and embracing a new and dangerous form of isolationism. I believe isolationism is just another word for appeasement on the world stage. And appeasement has never worked. Yeah, Mike Pence opposes appeasement. Unless it's his old boss, Donald Trump, who tried to have him killed, my running mate. He he refers to the guy who tried to have him killed as my running mate. The UAW's strike against Detroit's big three automakers enters day five on Tuesday. On Monday, Ford laid off 600 workers because of the strike. General Motors says roughly 2,000 workers should expect to get laid off by the end of this week. Of the 150,000 United Auto Workers, 9% are currently on strike. Strikers are entitled to $500 a week in strike salary, and by not calling a full strike, the UAW doesn't have to dip too far into their nearly three-quarters of a billion dollar strike fund. President Biden has sent Acting Labor Secretary Julie Hsu to Detroit to jumpstart the negotiations, which resume this week. The UAW is demanding a 40% wage increase and a four-day work week, insisting they made concessions after the Great Recession and have yet to see their salaries rise with the billions in profits the big three continue to rack up quarter after quarter. The Republicans are using the strike to push the big lie One of the many big lies that Republicans push, this big lie involves electric vehicles. The Republicans, because they're in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry, Republicans are claiming that electric vehicles are job killers. Yeah. Republicans are trying to protect the fossil fuel industry and they're insisting that electric cars are bad for workers because they're cheaper to make and require fewer workers than gas-powered cars do. Republicans say the switch to electric vehicles means that all car manufacturing in America will be shipped off to China, which they pretend, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. It's inevitable. Our hands are tied. We're just going to have to sit back and have our electric vehicles made in China. Look, we all know they're lying. Republicans don't care about saving jobs. They care about servicing their fossil fuel donors. And they know the switch to electric vehicles is bad, very bad for Exxon. So they introduced and passed in the House last week the Preserving Choice in Vehicle Purchases Act, the Preserving Choice in Vehicle Purchases Act, which would forbid states from banning the sales of internal combustion engines by the end of this decade, right? They want to outlaw, prevent states from outlawing the sale of gas-powered cars because more and more states are passing laws that are outlawing the sale of gas-powered cars in the coming decade. And California especially has done this. And California is a big threat to the fossil fuel industry because it's one of the largest car markets in the world. So for decades, Detroit has designed their cars 
according to California's emission standards. Now, California is insisting zero emissions by the end of the decade, and Detroit is responding. But Republicans in the House passed a bill forbidding California and other states like Washington state from passing laws that outlaw gas-powered cars because Republicans are all about states' rights, except when states' rights infringe on the rights of ExxonMobil to make record profits while destroying the planet. The bill, which got passed in the House, insists consumers should have a choice between gas-powered cars and electric vehicles because Republicans are all about choice, except when it comes to abortion. Congresswoman Debbie Dingell is a Democrat who represents Michigan. Here she is speaking out against the bill, which is going to be dead on arrival in the Senate. But many Republican presidential candidates, like Donald Trump, are singing its praises. The next debate is September 25th. I think it's at the Reagan Library. And you will hear a lot of Republican candidates at the next debate talking about how we need to pass in the Senate the Preserving Choice in Vehicle Purchases Act. Here is Michigan Congresswoman Democrat Debbie Dingell. This bill prevents EPA from granting a waiver of federal preemption under the Clean Air Act for any California vehicle mission standards that, quote, directly or indirectly limits the sale or use of vehicles with an internal combustion engine. On top of this, it directs the EPA to revoke waivers that were already granted more than a decade ago that don't comply with this vague metric. More from Debbie Dingell. Unfortunately, this is just yet another Republican attack on the Environmental Protection Agency's authority to keep Americans safe from dangerous air pollution, and it will have widespread harmful effects on the future of the automotive industry. She continued. The UAW opposes this bill. Sierra Club opposes this bill. LCV opposes this bill. We must stand with men and women who know what's best and oppose this bill. Debbie Dingle, her last, she shortened her last name. Uh, (laughs) I'm not going to do it. It used to be a lot longer. It was longer than Dingle. Uh but I'm not going to tell you. I think you've already figured out (laughs) what her full last name used to be. Uh, I don't have time. We're very, very busy. uh, Very, very busy. We're talking about unions. Meanwhile, actress Drew Moore, (laughs) Barry Moore, Dingleberry. I'm a child, okay? I was watching her, and I couldn't keep my mouth shut. Um, self-destructive, Debbie Dingleberry, which I'm sure nobody has ever called her before, right? This is why people stop watching me, because I'm self-destructive. It's not even funny, it's not clever, and I apologize to Debbie Dingle for the Debbie Dingleberry joke. What am I, three? Jesus. Meanwhile, actress Drew Dingleberry more... No, (laughs) Drew... I, uh, actress Drew Barrymore has decided her daytime talk show will not resume and she will honor striking members of the Writers Guild and, of course, striking actors. As I pointed out last week, this is Hollywood's biggest work stoppage since the 1960s when, for the first time in nearly 60-some-odd years, actors and writers have walked off their jobs together. This is a big strike in Hollywood. And while daytime talk show hosts like Drew Barrymore are being told by SAG-AFTRA to honor their contracts, some have chosen not to cross the WGA picket lines. Drew Barrymore announced last week that she was returning to work. Then, after being crucified on social media, she took to social media to deliver a heartfelt, tearful, meandering apology but didn't say she planned on going back on strike. 
That video was such a disaster to do damage control, she announced. Nope, I'm going to honor the Writers Guild and not be a scab. I'm So she is remaining on strike. Bill Maher, the Islamophobic corporate shill, called the writers who were striking, who are striking, he called them childlike, and reminded them that nobody is entitled to a job, and then announced he would return to his HBO hack fest without writers. But then, when he saw Drew Barrymore changing her mind, he said, you know what, Uh, I'm an original thinker after Drew Barrymore talks me into something. Here is the statement that Drew Barrymore made. I have listened to everyone. I am making the decision to pause the show's premiere until the strike is over. I have no words to express my deepest apologies to everyone I have hurt and, of course, to our incredible team who works on the show and has made it what it is today. We really try to find our way forward, and I truly hope for a resolution for the entire industry very soon, not to get too deep into the weeds. But Bill Maher's show is on HBO, and it's very easy not to come back if you're on a network. That's why Colbert, Fallon, Myers, they've all stayed on strike, because when you're part of a network, it's easier to stay off the air. Drew Barrymore is a daytime talk show that's syndicated. She has like 150 stations she has to deliver her show to, but she found her way to obey the writer's strike. And Bill Maher is a disgrace. He's a disgrace. You know, he's chickened out after, you know, Sherry Shepard, uh, Sherry Shepard, the Jennifer Hudson show, and the talk. Those are other talk shows like Bill Maher that said they were coming back, but they announced that their show would not be returning. So Bill Maher joined the daytime talk shows and announced he too would go back to honoring the striking writers. Uh, Really, Bill lacks the courage of his convictions. He's just, he just loves money. He could do one lousy stand-up concert, one lousy overpriced hacky stand-up concert and pay his staff with the money he's overpaid for. Uh, Well, talks between the unions and the studios stopped in August, but are now picking up again. Sandals and flip-flops are the clothing of choice for freshman senator from Pennsylvania, Democrat John Fetterman. So to accommodate Fetterman's working-class roots, and they are real, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announced that business attire will no longer be mandatory in the well of the Senate. This has outraged Republicans who say lack of business attire disrespects our capital. Storming, storming the Capitol with bear spray and zip ties, sending 140 police officers to the hospital, trashing Nancy Pelosi's office while committing millions of dollars worth of damage to the building. That's just legitimate political discourse, according to Republicans. But no suit, no tie, that's an insurrection. Trump supporters are all about ties. In fact, on January 6th, they, they bought one for Mike Pence to wear around his neck. That's a beautiful tie. That's the, what uh, Republicans consider business attire. I believe that's a Windsor knot. Well, Ron DeSantis is appalled that John Fetterman no longer has to wear a suit and a tie. To show up in the United States Senate with that and not have the decency to put on proper attire, I think it's disrespectful to the body. And I think the fact that the Senate changed the rules to accommodate that, um, you know, I think looks, speaks very poorly uh, to how they consider that. Look, we need this country, we need to be lifting up our standards in this country, not dumbing down our standards in this country. And this is an example why. Here, 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 yes. He's all about not dumbing down our standards. That's from the man who banned critical race theory and AP black studies from his classrooms, because the last thing 
Ron DeSantis wants is to dumb down our nation's standards. No sex education in our schools. Let kids figure it out, you know? We don't need to teach sex education in the schools. Well, you know, we'll have the kids learn all about sex from their mom's abusive boyfriend. Because the last thing Ron DeSantis wants is to dumb down our standards. That's why only Texas has banned more books than Ron DeSantis's Florida. It's why teacher pay in Florida is the fourth lowest in America. 100,000 students in Ron DeSantis's state lack a full-time teacher because there's a massive teaching shortage in Florida because he's raised the standards. He's, you know, he hasn't dumbed down the standards in Florida. Everybody's flocking to, to be a teacher in, in Florida because Ron DeSantis hasn't dumbed down the, the standards. Well, the truth is they, they have uh, 100,000 openings for teachers because of the restrictions. Don't say gay, Bill. You can't teach critical race. And nobody wants to work in Florida because of the persecution of the LGBTQ community and African Americans. Yeah, he's all about fighting the dumbing down of standards, which is why the number of Florida schools that got F ratings from the Department of Education has doubled since Ron DeSantis took office and said, we're not going to dumb down our standards here in the dumbest state of the union, Florida. Marjorie Taylor Greene called Schumer's lifting of the Senate dress code disgraceful. This is the same congresswoman who, re who refused to obey the House dress code, which said no guns. But she walked around the metal detectors anyway and ended up getting fined, I think, $5,000 by Nancy Pelosi because, you know, she wouldn't obey Nancy Pelosi's dress code. But she thinks it's a disgrace that John Fetterman doesn't have to wear a suit and tie in the Senate because, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene is all about decorum and civility. Here is the always well-mannered and properly demure Congresswoman voicing her criticism of Joe Biden's foreign policy in between power squats at the gym. Joe Biden, you're not a president. You're a piece of shit. That's Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene worried about civility in the Senate. Brian Warner, the 54-year-old rocker, also known as Marilyn Manson, pleaded no contest to blowing his nose on a videographer back in 2019 during a performance at the Bank of New Hampshire Pavilion in Guilford, New Hampshire. He pleaded no contest to two missed misdemeanor counts of simple assault, two misdemeanor accounts, I guess one for each nostril. Manson was sentenced to 20 hours of community service, and I think the best way he could serve the community would be to quit singing. 16 women have stepped forward accusing Manson of sexual assault last year after a 19-month investigation. The Los Angeles Sheriff's Office submitted several sexual assault allegations to the Los Angeles District Attorney for prosecution, but the District Attorney refused to file charges, saying more evidence was needed. Sound of Freedom tells the story of Tim Ballard, a former Homeland Security agent who rescues children from sex traffickers in Colombia. QAnon calls it the feel-good movie of the year. It is considered one of the most successful independent films ever made, and it grossed more than $200 million so far this year. Most of its audience consists of Trump supporters and the Christian right, since it perpetuates the stale trope that anyone who is rich, powerful, and liberal is part of some massive conspiracy to traffic underage children into this country. Donald Trump hosted a special screening of the movie at his Bedminster, New Jersey golf course. And I wonder if it was in the same screening room that he and Jeffrey Epstein used to watch movies. Well, Vice reported on Monday that Tim Ballard, 
upon whom this movie is based, quit Operation Underground Railroad, his nonprofit anti child trafficking organization, after an investigation revealed seven women have stepped forward accusing Tim Ballard of sexual misconduct. Up until news of this broke, Ballard was considering a run for Utah's Senate seat. Now I'm guessing he's definitely going to run for Utah's Senate seat. It's the only way to stay out of prison here in America. If you're charged with sexual misconduct, run for office, and then it's political. Congresswoman Lauren Boebert is drawing fire after new video shows her being groped by her date inside a Denver theater during a performance of Beetlejuice last week. Also, on video, you can see the congresswoman touching her boyfriend's groinal gonadal package region, and children were in attendance But when contacted, Denver's district attorney said they have no intention of charging her with lewd behavior. Boebert issued a public apology. This would be her second one. This time admitting that, yes, I was vaping inside the theater. She said originally that I wasn't vaping, but now the video is incontrovertible evidence that she was vaping. And she said, please forgive me, I'm going through a difficult divorce. Well, some Christians are not so forgiving. On Monday, the Texas Youth Summit, an annual meeting of young Christian conservatives, removed Boebert's name from the list of speakers scheduled to address their Woodlands, Texas conference at the end of the month. Their loss. It's going to be their loss, Lauren. Here is the video of the groping incident. Uh, Boebert has also come under fire for dating a Democrat. This is a Democrat who is groping her. He owns a Colorado bar that features drag queen night. On Monday, Boebert apologized. I'm not making this up. She apologized for dating a Democrat. She broke it off with him and promised to only be groped by Republicans in the future. Or she said something like that. She, she said she, she promised to only date Republicans from now on. Uh, you see her hand? Go, I mean, look at her hand. This is really inappropriate behavior. Okay. I, I, I'm, I apologize that you have to see this over and over again. All right. According to Great Britain's Channel 4 and the Sunday Times, four women have stepped forward claiming they were raped by comedian Russell Brand between 2006 and 2013. One woman says she was groomed by Brand, who was then in his 30s, and she lost her virginity to him when she was 16 years old. The age of consent in Great Britain is 16. The woman said she was later raped by Russell Brand. Brand took to social media Friday night to say he is innocent, and he's the victim in all this. He's the victim of a carefully orchestrated attack on his character because he has been so outspoken against the war in Ukraine and the COVID vaccine. Yes, that's why women would come forward and go through the gruesome ordeal of saying they were raped because... uh, they're mad at Russell Brand because he's uh, against the COVID vaccine. Yeah. On Saturday night, Brand played to a sold-out crowd in London, but by the end of the evening, the expose detailing years of inappropriate workplace behavior and rape aired on Channel 4. Brand has since announced that he will be canceling the rest of his comedy performances until further notice. London police have created a tip line for possible victims of Russell Brand to step forward. As of late Monday evening, one credible report is now being investigated. Since the documentary aired on Saturday night, more women have stepped forward, saying Brand's behavior was an open secret inside the comedy community. 
the BBC, and Hollywood. Brand, who admits to having been promiscuous at one time, reportedly asked staffers on his television show to pick out pretty women to bring back to his dressing room, an activity they described as making them feel like pimps. Other female employees complained that he would often expose himself, aggressively pursue them sexually, and make lascivious comments that were inappropriate in a workplace. Female comedians reportedly warned each other to avoid being alone with Brand. Several others have stepped forward to say that numerous television executives were fully aware that Brand was a sexual predator but didn't want to say anything, else they would lose their jobs. More and more videos have surfaced over the weekend of Brand grabbing female performers and journalists during televised interviews, and several comments he made have resurfaced where he makes light of his predatory behavior. Over the past decade, Brand went from acting to setting up his own personal YouTube accounts, where he ventured into becoming a wellness guru while expounding far-right conspiracy theories, insisting he was merely an open-minded liberal. Here is Alex Jones coming to the defense of his good friend Russell Brand, the open-minded liberal. And now because he comes out against Big Pharma, he comes out against the globalist, he comes out against the New World Order, suddenly the allegations are happening to him. Right. Also coming to the open-minded liberals' defense were Tucker Carlson, Elon Musk, and a man named Andrew Tate, who is currently facing charges of rape and human trafficking in Romania. Tucker Carlson said about Russell Brand, criticized the drug companies, questioned the war in Ukraine, and you can be pretty sure this is going to happen. Yes, in other words, uh, Tucker supports the victims. And Russell Tate, is that his name? Uh, no, Andrew Tate uh, said from Romania, where he's awaiting trial, Welcome to the club. On my way now to fight the crazy bitch allegations. Wow, that's somebody Russell really needs in his corner. Somebody who's on his way to fight the crazy bitch allegations. And Elon Musk took to social media and said, I support Russell Brand. That man is not evil. All this canceling must stop. Wow, Elon Musk knows that Russell Brand is not evil. He knows everything. And all this canceling must stop. Yes, it's the cancel culture. A, a man is accused of raping a 16-year-old girl. And, yep, it's the cancel culture destroying Russell Brand. Right? He, he, it's another thing, you know, another... Somebody says something inappropriate like raping a 16-year-old girl, allegedly, and it's the cancel culture. I thought, can, like, I thought you got canceled for what you said. I, I didn't know you can... It's also canceling if you're accused of raping a 16-year-old girl. It's so hard to figure out what these fascists think. Yoel Roth headed Twitter's trust and safety division until Elon Musk took over. Twitter last year and then fired him. Roth was in charge of fighting disinformation during the 2016 and 2020 presidential election. He has a PhD and he came under criticism by Republicans this year for shadow banning the reporting that the New York Post had done on Hunter Biden's laptop. He had shadow banned the New York Post story about Hunter Biden's laptop in the lead up to the 2020 presidential election. Roth was following Twitter policy, which prohibited at that time any hacked material from being spread on the platform. Hunter Biden's laptop had indeed been hacked by Rudy Giuliani after it had been turned over to him by the computer repairman with whom Hunter Biden left it. 
Republicans have since blamed Roth for hiding the Hunter Biden story from voters by keeping it off Twitter temporarily. And this, they say, is the reason that Trump lost, because Twitter kept the Hunter Biden story off Twitter temporarily. And that's why Trump lost. Well, after Musk fired him, he began spread. Uh, after Musk fired him, Musk began spreading misinformation about Roth, who was married to another man. Musk was allegedly instrumental in spreading lies that Roth is a proponent of pedophilia, which Marjorie Taylor Greene accused him of when he was forced to testify before the House Oversight Committee hearing on the Hunter Biden laptop controversy earlier this year. Roth had to go into hiding and on Monday published a piece in the New York Times entitled, Trump attacked me, then Musk did, it wasn't an accident. In this article, he describes the concerted effort on the far right headed by Elon Musk, not just to silence him, but to terrify him as well. He writes in the New York Times, I've lived with armed guards outside my home and have had to upend my family, go into hiding for months, and repeatedly move. He continues in his article in the New York Times, Mr. Musk went further by taking a paragraph of my PhD dissertation out of context to basically claim that I condone pedophilia, a conspiracy trope commonly used by far-right extremists and QAnon adherents to smear LGBTQ people. He continues to write, you need to swing from an old oak tree for the treason you have committed. Live in fear every day, unquote, said one of thousands of threatening tweets and email. That's from Elon Musk. Uh, kind of encouraged that. But Elon Musk knows that Russell Brand is not evil. And all this canceling has to stop. Birmingham, Alabama, police officers tased and then arrested a black director of a Jefferson County, Alabama high school band after he disobeyed the police officer's order for the band to stop playing. Johnny Mims has been with the high school since 2019. Officers approached Mims after the game and asked him to order his band to stop performing. They wanted to clear out the parking lot. Mims, the band leader, according to police, instructed his band to continue performing. When police tried to handcuff Mims, he refused to put his hands behind his back, whereupon he was tased. Did I mention this was Alabama and that Johnny Mims is black? When uh, he was uh, tased and then he was charged with disorderly conduct, harassment, and resisting arrest. First, they took him to the hospital after he was tased, and then he was charged with disorderly conduct, harassment, and resisting arrest. So to best understand why something like this happened, why these white police officers tased a black band leader, high school band leader, because he was being disrespectful. I mean, he was, you're going to handcuff a high school band leader because he wouldn't tell his band to stop playing. Uh, to best understand why this happened, here is Congressman Al Green from Texas. He was speaking on the floor of the House last week. He talked for an hour last week, and I watched him on C-SPAN. It was an amazing speech about institutionalized white supremacy and how it informs law enforcement. And I watched that speech, and then a couple days later, I read about this black band leader getting tased by Alabama police, and I thought the best way to explain why something like that happens is to get a little critical race theory from Texas Democratic Congressman Al Green. And with this lawful segregation came the notion 
it didn't go away, that the persons who were segregated had to be obedient. They had to be subservient. They had to be obsequious. The ending of slavery did not end the mentality that had been inculcated in society. Society now, remember, had been corrupted with this mentality. And this was passed on through the generations that these people who came, who were brought here to be this permanent, subservient, obsequious class, some would say underclass, class. It wasn't, it didn't end with them being extricated from slavery by way of the 13th Amendment. It was still within society. It had been baked into society. And even to this day, it still resides in society to a certain extent. Not to the same extent, but to a certain extent. But it was in my lifetime, in my lifetime, racism and invidious discrimination which is what the slavery and then the police, the leasing of persons, uh, metamorphosed into, then evolved and metamorphosed into something that we called invidious discrimination. Uh, this notion that black people should be subservient and obsequious. It still exists. It exists to the extent that black men cannot talk to police officers the same way white men can. That's Congressman Al Green. And if I were a teacher in Florida and I played that speech, I would be fired, but it does explain why Mr. Mim, Mr. Mims, the band leader, Johnny Mims, in Alabama was tased by police. He's black and the police wanted him to be obsequious. It's baked into our system. And if you don't know that, well, learn it. Can't learn it in Florida, but it's, it's systemic. And that's the truth. Learn it. Jan Wenner, the founder of Rolling Stone magazine, apologized for the comments he made to the New York Times while promoting his new book on the history of rock music. During the interview, Wenner was asked why all the people he talked to for his book were white male musicians. Wenner, a white male, said he couldn't find any women or African Americans who could articulate properly what rock music meant and the influence it had on the 60s. Wow, couldn't find a single woman or a black musician to articulate what rock music uh, meant and the uh, influence it had on the 60s. I'm sure he looked very hard. Wenner was after he made those comments, he was immediately thrown off the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's board of directors. And Rolling Stone magazine, which he no longer runs, has now distanced itself from him. All right. Texas Republican Attorney General Ken Paxton was acquitted during a Senate trial over the weekend after the Texas House of Representatives voted to impeach him on corruption charges. Paxton still faces criminal charges for taking money from a rich donor who allegedly paid for the remodeling of Paxton's home. He also, the rich donor, allegedly provided work for Paxton's mistress so she could be closer to Paxton. Paxton, as attorney general, has been a huge supporter of Donald Trump's 
who lobbied for Paxton's acquittal via social media. Paxton, in 2020, filed a lawsuit on behalf of Texas and attorneys general from other red states asking the Supreme Court to overturn the presidential election results. Here is Texas Representative Ann Johnson, who served as the impeachment manager during Paxton's trial. The Board of Managers presented overwhelming evidence that Ken Paxton is the most corrupt politician in the state of Texas at this time. And the Republicans in the Texas Senate just returned him to the office of top cop. I will rely on what I said on the floor of the Texas House. God help us. God help us. ABC News reported Monday night that one of Trump's longtime assistants told special counsel Jack Smith that Trump would often hand her to-do lists on, and I wish I were making this up, on classified <laughs> documents. I mean, he's just, he's just begging for it, you know? He just, like, he's just saying, why won't you arrest me already? He would hand her to-do lists on classified documents that he had been keeping from the FBI and the National Archives in direct violation of the Espionage Act. Her name is Molly Michael. She told prosecutors that she grew concerned about the way Donald Trump carelessly handed her lists of things for her to do for him that were written on note cards, which on the other side contained classified memos that were marked classified. Well, you don't want to waste paper, right? Just, I mean, it's just a flagrant, flagrant abuse of the Espionage Act. He's going out of his way. Here, just, here, here's a war plan for uh, Iran. It's classified. Don't read the war plan for Iran, but here's a to-do list. And uh, on the to-do list is don't read the war plan for Iran on the other side of the to-do list. I mean, how can he not be, anyway, when the FBI, this is according to ABC News, when the FBI came to search Mar-a-Lago for documents, uh, she told reporters, she told prosecutors, I'm sorry, she told prosecutors that when the, <laughs> when the FBI, when the FBI came a calling to look for the classified material. Trump told her, quote, you don't know anything about the boxes. <laughs> it's like, it's so ham-fisted. This is such a, the classified material case is just a slam dunk. Unfortunately, I don't think he goes to prison for this, but there's, this is why it was the first indictment that Jack Smith handed down because he wanted to put numbers on the board. Trump is guilty. Everybody knows it, that he's guilty, not only of mishandling classified documents, but of obstruction of justice. There's no question. There's no question. Jenna Ellis was Trump's attorney during the lead up to January 6th, and she worked with Rudy... Giuliani, she traveled around the country with Rudy, trying to convince state, le uh, state lawmakers and state legislatures that Joe Biden stole the presidential election. Of course he did. She is now facing racketeering charges down in Georgia. Because she's deeply religious and from Colorado, Jenna Ellis spoke out against Lauren Boebert on her Christian-themed radio show this week. And then she turned to Donald Trump. She turned to Donald Trump and then turned on Donald Trump, who she has repeatedly asked to pay her legal fees, right? She's one of the 19 co-defendants down in Georgia, and she has publicly said the Save America PAC that Trump has set up has raised hundreds of millions of dollars. And why do I have to have a GoFundMe page when Donald Trump could pay my legal fees? Here's what Jenna Ellis said on her Christian radio show on Monday. 
I simply can't support him for elected office again. She's talking about Donald Trump. So do you think she's going to flip in Georgia? I simply can't support him for elected office again. Why I have chosen to distance is because of that, frankly, malignant narcissistic tendency to simply say that he's never done anything wrong. She continued on her show, the total idolatry that I'm saying from some of the supporters that are unwilling to put the Constitution and the country and the conservative principles above their love for a star is really troubling. She went on, I think that we do need to, as Americans and as conservatives, and particularly as Christians, take this very seriously and understand where are we putting our vote. It's amazing what an indictment can do. It can really change a person. Meanwhile, nine California state lawmakers on Monday asked the California State Attorney General, Rob Bonta, to seek what is called declaratory relief from the state courts and eventually, I guess, the Supreme Court to determine whether Donald Trump's name can be stricken from the California Republican primary ballot. They were citing the 14th Amendment's Section 3, which forbids any government official from holding office if they participated in or aided and abetted an insurrection. Declaratory relief means the attorney general, if they, if he, if Bonda responds to the lawmakers, declaratory relief means that the attorney general of California would file a motion with the state court for guidance to determine whether he would be allowed to remove Trump. Eight members of the California Assembly and one member of the California Senate signed the letter. All nine are Democrats. The clock is ticking. California law dictates that December 8th of this year is the date when the Secretary of State of California certifies who qualifies for the primary ballot. They're trying to scrub Trump from the Republican primary ballot, not the November general election, but from the Republican primary ballot. The lawmakers in the note They said by going straight to the attorney general instead of the secretary of state, they can expedite the issue, which will only be resolved eventually by the Supreme Court. It has to be resolved. It's going to go before the Supreme Court sometime before the California primary. Meanwhile, in California, not California, in Colorado, October 30th has been set as the hearing date for the courts to begin hearing a lawsuit filed by six Colorado residents demanding that their state's attorney general, who's a Democrat, remove Donald Trump's name from the Republican primary ballot, citing the 14th Amendment's insurrection clause as well. This seems to be building up steam. So if you're... Attorney General, if you live in a state where the Attorney General, not the Attorney General, the Secretary of State, if you live in a state that has a Democratic uh, Secretary of State, chances are there's going to be a lawsuit filed with the court uh, where they're going to try to kick Trump's name off the primary ballots. So this is going to be interesting. In a speech over the weekend, Donald Trump opened with a bed of ominous music playing in the background as he warned that Joe Biden was the most corrupt and dangerous president in American history. And the worst president in the history of our country who is cognitively impaired, in no condition to lead, and is now in charge of dealing with Russia and possible nuclear war. Just think of it. We would be in World War II very quickly if we're going to be relying on this man and far more devastating than any war. There will never be a war. If that happens, there will never be a war like this. 
Oh, I'm sorry, what did you say? You said what? In World War II. World War II. That Biden's going to lead us into World War II. That's scary. Uh, I, not another World War II. You know, because we already had a World War II. And if there's going to be World War II Part B, uh, that's terrifying. Trump was going to say World War III, but his followers can't count that high. So uh, remind me again, Joe Biden, what's the problem? Uh, remind me again, Donald Trump, what's the problem with Biden again? Cognitively impaired. Right. Cognitively impaired. Those are some big words for a five-year-old, as, <laughs> as that old joke goes. Those are some pretty fancy words for a someone with a five-year-old mentality. You know that joke? It's a great, bad joke, bad joke. Meet the press as a new host, Kirsten Welker. And she went to Harvard and she figured, I went to Harvard. I'm smarter than Trump. Now, there are four criminal trials going on, right? Donald Trump is facing four criminal trials, plus several big civil lawsuits. And the special counsel is requesting a gag order to prevent Trump from poisoning the jury pool. We reported on this Friday night, right? And so when you platform Donald Trump, you're poisoning the jury pool. He uses this as an opportunity to tell millions and millions of people that Jack Smith and the judge... It, they're fascists, they're Marxists, they're crazy, they're insane, they're deranged. So by giving him a platform, you are uh, potentially poisoning the jury pool. And this is why the special counsel is requesting a gag order. But NBC needs ratings and the hell with potential gag orders if you went to Harvard like Kristen Welker did, you're convinced you're doing the Lord's work and you're going to get Trump to incriminate himself. That's what Harvard-educated Kristen Welker, the new host of Meet the Press, told herself that she's, she can handle this and she's going to get Donald Trump to incriminate himself. But Trump wins when he goes on television. He always wins in these interviews because he's a liar. He's, he lies, and it's impossible to correct him. He told something like 30 lies during his Meet the Press interview on Sunday. One of the most outrageous ones was that Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger was fine with that phone call. He wasn't. Uh, uh, the lies go on and on in this interview, Here's the interesting thing. It wasn't a live interview, which means that NBC News, Kirsten Welker, could have stopped tape after each lie, but they didn't. You know, I understand that had it been live on Meet the Press, you can't fact check in real time because it's live. But if you're taping an interview with this liar, you can put a big Chiron over the screen and ring a bell every time he's lying, but they didn't do that. So thanks to NBC News, Meet the Press, and Harvard's very own Kristen Welker on Sunday, we, we saw a hard-hitting interview, and she got Trump to admit this about January 6th. I behaved so well. Okay, that's, that's big. And then he confessed to this. I did such a good job. You got him. Good for you, Harvard-educated Kristen Welker. You got Donald Trump to admit that he did such a good job on January 6th. And then we found out, then she got this out of him. Uh, we found out January 6th wasn't Donald Trump's fault and that he had offered to help, but... Nancy Pelosi turned down 10,000 soldiers. Nancy Pelosi, it's Nancy Pelosi's fault because uh, he offered her 10,000 soldiers. Here is where Harvard-educated Kirsten Welker tries to fact-check the liar. 
What do you say to people who wonder why you, you as commander in chief, you have authorities that Nancy Pelosi doesn't have as commander in chief. No, no, she has authority over why the Why didn't Capitol. you send help in that moment, though? Uh, uh, hang on. Got to remember which lie to tell. Okay. Uh, okay, continue. What? <laughs> Just trying to remember what, what lie am I supposed to spew here. Here we go. You have authorities that no one else has as the commander in chief. Do you think you showed leadership on that? Yes, absolutely. I did. Wow. Yeah. You know, he just needed a little time to shuffle through his Rolodex of lies that Kristen Welker isn't going to be able to refute because he's going to talk over her. So she cornered him and he said he did a great job on January 6th. Very hard very hard hitting interview. I mean, he, she is just mopping the floor with Donald Trump, but that's what a Harvard education gets you. Continue. This is really hard hitting. Tell me how you watched this all unfold. Were you in the dining room watching TV? I'm not going to tell you. I'll tell people later at an appropriate time. I'm not going to tell you. Go on. What did you and do I when the Capitol was under attack, though? Let me Mr. just tell you. In the moment that the Capitol was Did you see the statements attack. I made in the Oval Office and just outside of the Oval Office? Absolutely. Go I was home. there that day. Our police are great. We love our police. We love everybody. Go home. That was, this was that a was beautiful more, that statement. That was at 4 well, o'clock in the afternoon, made, more than I, I don't know. three but hours the, after the attack started. But there were tweets that were put out before that. I want to know who you called By the way, on that day. Nancy Pelosi. I, I, I don't have. Why would I tell you that? Listen. Nancy don't want to talk Pelosi about that. was in charge of security. She turned down 10,000 soldiers. If she didn't turn down the soldiers, you wouldn't have had January 6th. Did you call military or law enforcement? What? <laughs> okay. There were like 10,000 lies contained inside that, that segment just there about the 10,000 soldiers. This was taped. So... You know, Harvard-educated Kirsten Welker should have been, there should have been a scroll saying, this is a lie, fact check, fact check, fact check. Instead, he poisoned potential jurors by talking over her because he's better, he's better at this than everybody, which is why he needs to go to prison. Why would I tell you that? I'm I'm just going to lie. That's, that's how he, the last thing he said is, why would I tell you that? Continue. What? Okay, I said, uh, continue, uh, please. Did you call military or law enforcement at the moment the Capitol was under attack? I'm not going to tell you anything. I okay. told, I... I'm not going to tell you anything. I know exactly what I'm doing here, and I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm not going to tell attack. you anything. I'm not going to tell you anything. He said that like 20 times. I'm not going to tell you anything. He knows he knows exactly how to do this. I'm not going to tell you. I'll tell people later at an appropriate time. Mm hmm. Why would I tell you that? Why would I tell you that? Why would I tell you throughout the interview? It was like the scorpion. I'm not going to tell you anything. Why would I tell you that? I'm not going to tell you this. Now I'm going to talk over you and why? And because you want access to me you will not correct my 10,000 lies. So congratulations to Kirsten Welker, the the new Harvard-educated host to Meet the Press, for gaining access and hopefully ratings for your new job on Meet the Press, where we learned, where this is, this is the, what we got out of this interview. This is what you were able to get from Donald Trump when it comes to January 6th, he confessed to this. I behaved so well. You got him. And then, then you cornered him and he said, I did such a good job. Yeah, we got to give him more access to the media because, you know, when he's under the glare of the spotlight, he always cracks. And it's good for potential jurors to, to see him This is really good for America. It's always good to platform a fascist who is an expert liar. Good for you. Good on you, NBC, Meet the Press, 
and Harvard's Kristen Welker. Good on you. Maybe we should have a gag order for Meet the Press instead of Donald Trump. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Thank you for watching this. Please share this with your friends. That's the best way to help me and the show. Get the word out. This is a grassroots show. And uh, so if you can share this with people you know, that that's the best way, either through social media or on uh, through email. Thank you to the moderators in the chat room. Thank you to all of you who leave comments. I read all of them. I started the show with a correction. So, you know, uh, I, I've become reliant on your, uh, your comments. So thank you for that. Please, did I say, did I ask you to like this video? Please like the video. That way I remain in your feed if you want that. And please subscribe to my channel. And this is a, a, an audio podcast so you can listen to this wherever podcasts are downloaded. We also post this as a podcast on YouTube. There's a playlist where you can just listen to this. There's no, there are no visuals. Please subscribe to my newsletter. And uh, I think that covers everything. I will see you... I hope tomorrow at 12.05 a.m. Eastern, unless it's a busy day uh, as today was and I had to start at 12.30 a.m. Eastern. Once again, thank you so much for listening.